I'm Julie Zenner, and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. We'll talk with retiring UMB Chancellor Lendley Black about his legacy at the university and what the future may hold. We'll have a story that hits close to home, a life-changing kidney transplant for this program's producer. And we'll have a video wrap-up of last weekend's Grandma's Marathon back to full strength following two years of pandemic changes. These stories and reaction to the Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade coming up on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thanks for watching. Denny has the night off tonight. Let's get started with the headlines. The Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade Friday morning, removing the constitutional protection for abortion in the United States. Overturning the landmark ruling puts abortion back in the purview of the states. Reaction to the ruling was swift from folks on both sides of the issue. This is certainly a day that pro-lifers have been waiting for for 49 years. Today's Supreme Court decision was a step to protect the most precious and basic right, the right to life. Roe versus Wade was unconstitutional. The pro-life community has always known this. Now, the American people will be able to decide the issue of abortion through their elected officials. This is what democracy looks like. Elected leaders accountable to the people they represent, that propose and pass laws that people support. The Constitution gives the people this job. With laws being pr proposed and passed all over the country to limit or ban access to abortion, there is now extreme urgency to act here in Minnesota to protect patients and providers. I am already the lead author in the Senate of the Patient's Right to Know Act and the Reproductive D Freedom Defense Act. And Senator Jen McEwen, who couldn't be here today, is the lead Senate author of the PRO Act. We understand that the work in front of us is challenging, but we know that all across Minnesota, community members have been working on these issues for years. And we are excited to partner with them to make sure that in Minnesota, people can access the reproductive health care that they need in their communities, free from harassment, and without fear of violence. As a society, we have made it our point to work to make tomorrow better for future generations, more free, more just, so that our children can more fully live their lives. That has been the experience of every generation in this country. And today, my daughters woke up with less rights than they had yesterday. In other news, the city of Duluth is the winner of the 2022 Sustainable City Award from the League of Minnesota Cities. The award was announced Thursday night at the league's annual meeting at the deck. Duluth was honored for developing and implementing its climate action work plan earlier this year. Northwood Technical College received a nearly $10 million workforce grant this week. The grant was announced by Governor Tony Evers at Northwood's Rice Lake campus. The grant focuses on two challenges facing Northwest Wisconsin, affordable housing and skilled workers in manufacturing. And if you are a Duluth entrepreneur looking for a space to set up your business, the Greater Downtown Council has a deal for you. Pop-up space and vacant storefronts on Superior Street will be available free for three months, complete with $1,500 toward expenses. The Downtown Council is teaming up with the Duluth 1200 Fund to activate vacant space downtown. Well, after more than a decade on the job, the Chancellor of the University of Minnesota Duluth is retiring. His tenure has been marked by a number of successes and also the challenge of a world pandemic. Joining us to talk about that and more is Lendley Lynn Black, the retiring Chancellor at UMD. And Chancellor, thank you for coming in. I know your, your days are probably getting pretty busy as you get closer to the end, but um, You've been at UMD for a dozen years, as we mentioned in the introduction. How have you seen the UMD campus change over that time? Well, first of all, Julie, thank you very much for mm -hmm. having me. I've always enjoyed our visits over the last several years, and, and I appreciate very much what, what you do with this program. Um, many, many, many changes uh, have happened. Uh, when I first came to UMD, I put a strong focus on strategic planning and strategic thinking 
and we developed a, a strategic plan that first year. Also along with that, we developed a, a comprehensive plan for addressing equity and diversity on our campus. Uh, and we've also now linked into the strategy planning of the University of Minnesota as a whole and linked our planning with a system-wide strategic plan that President Gable instituted. But, but the whole, all that strategic planning means nothing if it does not impact students. And I think the thing I've, I've seen most and I'm most proud of is the, um, the continual increase in our student success because we've seen our retention rates reach new heights. Uh, we've seen our graduation rates increase dramatically and also our numbers of students graduating the last several years has uh, continued to break records. So that, that is something that, that's certainly a hallmark. Uh, we've also um, seen a number of new academic programs at UMD, uh, things that are geared towards student demands, but also meeting workforce needs. A lot of these are interdisciplinary programs. Uh, for example, uh, we have uh, new programs like uh, uh, sales um, management and new sales program. Uh, we have a marketing, uh, marketing program that links up with design, so design and marketing focus. We will also have a new suite of American Indian majors uh, that, that are new uh, since, since I arrived. So there's that and, and um, I think the other major change has been in our fundraising efforts. Um, we, we need private support to supplement what we receive from the state and from the system and from tuition dollars. And we just completed a couple of years ago a 10-year uh, comprehensive campaign. Uh, this was a system-wide campaign and the UMD goal was a stretch goal of $120 million mm -hmm. and we raised over $170 million during that campaign. And that's provided uh, tremendous support, a lot of new scholarships for students. Uh, support for faculty. We, we now have new endowed chairs, distinguished professorships for faculty that we did not have before, and also has helped our facilities. Um, and I'm, I'm pleased that we have spent over $150 million in facility improvements uh, during my tenure. Uh, things like renovation of buildings, uh, the creation of the new HICLA chemistry advanced material science building, those kinds of things. So I think if you, know, if you look at in terms of the, the thrust of UMD, the strategy of UMD, the student accomplishments, uh, fundraising facilities, uh, it, it really is a different campus now and, and uh, I'm, I'm very proud of, of where we are. Mm -hmm. You took a lot of my questions already. Oh, good, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see your questions. You also were at the helm <laughs> during the pandemic. Yes. Talk about that experience and, and how it changed UMD and, and maybe how it continues to influence how things are done there. Yeah, Julia, that's, a, that's a, great, a great question. And I mean, the short answer is that's probably the most difficult period of my career in over 40 years in higher education, in part because it happened so quickly and we had to change within a matter of days how we were offering classes. We had to switch to total remote instruction and, and get our faculty prepared to do that as best we could. And it, it just really was a difficult time uh, the good news is that we were able to get through it without any major uh, outbreaks of COVID on our campus or among our faculty and staff. Uh, certainly we had some, mm -hmm. but uh, we, were, we, we, we set aside quarantine and isolation rooms for our students and those never became completely full during the, the first couple of years, the, the highlight of uh, the high point, I guess I should say, of the pandemic. Um, but the bad news is it, it, it really hurt us badly in terms of enrollment. Mm. Uh, in, in the spring of 2020, our enrollment was looking great. We had projections to have another enrollment increase. We had projections to have a balanced budget uh, for the first time in a while. And then when the pandemic hit and students decided not to come back, it really, really hit us um, pretty dramatically in mm. our enrollment. We've been, begun to recover some from that but we still have a long ways to go. The other, the other thing that, it, the other impact it really has had is on the just general um, uh, mood of people. People are tired, they're, they're frustrated, there's still uh, a lot of uncertainty. Uh, they've, they've done an incredible job on our campus of adjusting to the changes we had to make in terms of instruction and uh, the way people have 
kept things clean, used masks. I mean, all the things we asked them to do, they've done. But it's still, it's just been a very trying time for people. And, and again, we're beginning to see some of that turn for the better, mm -hmm. but it's still, I think it's gonna take us a while to truly, truly overcome some of the, the impacts of mm -hmm. the pandemic. So what are your plans for retirement? Well, um, I keep telling people the main thing I wanna do is to have no meetings <laughs> and to not have my uh, phone going off at five o'clock in the morning when there's bad weather coming. Um, and just to have more time to myself, to sort of uh, relax a bit. Uh, this is a, a very high demand job that I'm in, a very public job. And I, you know, I've always, I, I've enjoyed my job, but it really takes a toll after a while. And so mostly I'm looking to sort of recenter myself, looking to relax a bit. Um, I have a wonderful family, uh, four gorgeous grandchildren and uh, three grown uh, children. Um, so Connie and I are really looking forward to spending more time with them. We also want to travel primarily first in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, we've spent a lot of time, we grew up in the South, we spent time in New England, obviously the Midwest and the Far West, but we've never really spent time on those marvelous national parks that I hear mm -hmm. about between here and in Washington and California. So we want to really explore those. All right, I, I'm going to have to wrap you up, but you mentioned okay. before we went on the air that you're going to stay involved in the community. So I have a feeling we haven't seen the last of you. Absolutely, I, I will. Lynn Black, Chancellor of UMD, thank you so much. I will much. do that. Thank you, Julie. It's great to see you. All right. It's time now for Voices of the Region. Each week we hear from a journalist covering stories of interest in the Northland. This week our reporter is author and columnist Aaron Brown from Itasca County. So the big news uh, in, in iron mining right now in, in June is that the United Steelworkers of America are negotiating with the major steel companies over labor contracts in our iron range mines. Uh, these uh, companies include U.S. Steel and Cleveland Cliffs chiefly, uh, and these contracts are long-term deals to uh, to dictate, you know, not just wages, but also benefits and working conditions in the mines. And of course, these contracts are always a big deal for thousands of workers in the industry, uh, but they also kind of set the pace for a lot of other negotiations out there and um, really set the pace of uh, income and, and, you know, status of one of our chief industries. And the, what makes it significant this year is of course we've been running hot as they say in the mining business. Uh, iron mines have been busy, have been shipping product uh, in a high demand, high price situation. Usually that's very good news for the miners who are asking for um, you know, better contracts. Um, but we are in these new unsettled, um, this new unsettled territory right now because uh, inflation has been a big story. Inflation has hit everywhere, including uh, the iron range and iron mines. And so looking at cost of living, miners are going to want more and the mines are going to want to not give as much just because of the cost of things. We've had a, a couple of violent storms in my area here in eastern Itasca County. I know it has been widespread, however, I, this week we had a major power outage Monday night with, kind of, I won't say at the pop-up storm, but it, it was a storm that kind of snuck up on us and had some high winds and caused a lot of damage. I know I had a burning tree on top of a power line at my at the end of my driveway. That's never that's never good. Um, and, and that kind of thing has been happening. And we had, of course, a bigger storm on Memorial Day, the evening of Memorial Day. We had a long term power outage here and, and a lot of rural customers of both Minnesota Power and Lake Country Power. Um, had extended power outages, and, and that kind of thing has been happening this summer. It's been a very wet year. Uh, compared to last year's drought, we are you know, well ahead on, on moisture now, and, and so we've had um, a lot of challenges with storm damage. I mean, uh, you're getting a lot of use out of the chainsaws and the, uh, the wood splitters. There, there's a lot of that going on all over the place here in northern Minnesota. 
we're going through the calendar now and, and all of these special events that these small towns have had are now being offered again in their full glory with no limitations uh, in the post-COVID world. I won't say post-COVID world because we're still very much dealing with the virus, but people are able to gather more and, and um, uh, the spread is, is more or less uh, under control for now. Uh, and of course the summer is a great time because you can be outside. So uh, lots of these events are happening. So we're, of course, 4th of July on the Iron Range is historically this great kind of um, um, jubilee of, of outside activity and, and uh, parades and street dances and fireworks displays and, and small town uh, small town celebrations, races, kitty races, costumes. It's, it's a big deal. And I know it's a big deal everywhere, but I always point out that on the Iron Range, uh, 4th of July was a chance to prove you're an American. And for uh, a place that was built on uh, more than half immigrant at one point, more than half foreign born people, um, it was a big deal to kind of show your patriotism and, and to celebrate your new country, your new home. And so that tradition has been passed down through the generations. And and it's a very big deal still. And, and this year, we, there's no limitations. You can go to your parades, you can go to your street dances, and uh, people are very excited about it. At any given time, there are nearly 100,000 people on the wait list for a kidney transplant in the United States, and the average wait time is five years. That's the situation our show's producer was in, waiting to get that all-important call before his kidneys failed. But then his wife learned of a little-known program that allowed him to get a kidney before having to go on dialysis. Here to share his story is Greg Grell, longtime producer of Almanac North, and my friend, and you are looking great. Thank you Thanks, for Julie. coming in and sharing your story. I just walked down the hallway. You did, you did. <laughs> Tell people a little bit about your kidney condition and, and how it was impacting your life. So I have a condition called polycystic kidney disease. It's mm -hmm. one of a number of different uh, issues that people can have with their kidneys. In my, in my case, polycystic kidney di disease, or PKD is what it's commonly called, is a hereditary condition. So it passed down from my father's side of the family. Uh, when uh, people that have polycystic disease uh, have kids, it's supposed to be a 50-50 chance of passing it on. But unfortunately, in my family, all of us, there's three of us, I have two siblings, and they both have it as well as I do and they've both had kidney transplants uh, several years ago. Mm -hmm. So were there signs or symptoms that your situation was progressing and that you were really in need of, of a new kidney soon? Sure, once I was diagnosed with PKD, which was about 15 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, one of the main symptoms is higher blood pressure, but to actually be diagnosed, they just, it's a simple ultrasound. They can actually see the cysts that are growing in your kidneys. Uh, for me, uh, you keep an eye on it by doing blood tests, and the blood tests are for something called your glomular filtration rate, which is just a technical term for how effectively your kidneys are filtering your blood. And the average person's GFR, glomular filtration, filtration rate, is 60 or above. Uh, when I had my kidney transplant, I had been down to six for several months. So I was one-tenth of what an average person has for kidney function. Mm -hmm. So talk about the National Kidney Registry's standard voucher program, because that's something that a lot of people might not know about, and it could really save some lives. Right, in fact, when I went on the transplant list two and a half years ago, I was on what's your basic transplant uh, list, which is you're waiting for somebody to die, basically, that matches you, and then you get a call and they say, you need to be here in five hours. So with this voucher system, if you have a person in your life who's willing to donate a kidney, a friend or a family member, uh, but they aren't a match for you, they can still donate into this kidney registry. And what it does is then it puts your name, in my case, my name, up to the top of the list to find a match. The other advantage of it is instead of waiting for somebody to die to get a kidney, you're getting a kidney from a person who's living and you're, they're able to make a much better match and the outcomes are much better if you can go that way. So my wonderful wife decided to donate a kidney. We knew she hadn't been a match for me, but when we found out about this program, she decided to donate a kidney. She donated back in January. And the nice thing about that is we didn't have to have our surgery simultaneously. <laughs> she was able to recover. And then I was waiting for the call, which I got uh, 
at basically at the beginning of May, and I had my transplant on May 4th. So it's been about six weeks. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful gift, but it had to be kind of frightening for you as a husband, too, to watch your wife go through this surgery to help you out. Right, and that's one of the reasons why I never asked her to donate the kidney <laughs> for me, because that's such a personal decision, and I would never do that. But uh, she came through it with flying colors. One of the things that people wonder about is, well, you have two kidneys. Can you live on one kidney? And the answer is yes. In fact, uh, they expect her kidney function to just about get up to like maybe 80 or 90% of where it was with two. So one kidney is able to, you know, very successfully filter your blood. I have my two old kidneys, which are doing a little bit of work, and now the new kidney, which is doing the lion's share of the work. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything about your donor? No, that's one of the things. It's, it is a completely anonymous situation. The only thing I know is that it was a 28-year-old man in Portland, Oregon, that donated the kidney. And my wife's kidney went to a, a man in Texas. Mm -hmm. So it's a nationwide program. Mm -hmm. And the recovery is going well for, for both you and for Juliana? Right. So I've been back at work. This is my second week back. I've been feeling real good. The healing is over. Still mm -hmm. a little tired, but uh, getting that stamina back after being in a position where I couldn't really get much exercise for about the last six months before the surgery because I was just so fatigued from my, my kidneys not functioning well. So, mm -hmm. so if people want to get some information, um, where can they go? The best place would be the uh, ki National Kidney Registry. Uh, that's both for donors and recipients. If you need a kidney, you can go on there and find out about the program. And if you have somebody in your life or just somebody who's watching today that would be interested in donating a kidney, that does happen. People just decide to donate a kidney without even having a, a recipient in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, so it helps because there are, like you said in the intro, you know, thousands and thousands of people waiting for a kidney and many don't get one. All right. Well, you're usually the one who gives me the wrap. Now somebody else is giving you the wrap. All right. But thank you so much, Greg, and congratulations. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, good Julie. luck going forward. Thanks. Thanks. Well, perfect weather conditions welcomed runners at the 46th Annual Grandma's Marathon last weekend. From Two Harbors to Canal Park, the streets were packed with participants from all over the world. Producer Megan McGarvey brings us a special look at the race. Thanks everybody once again. Thanks to all the volunteers as well for making all of this possible. 46th annual Grandma's Marathon. Without the support of hundreds and thousands of volunteers, many of whom we work with throughout the year to make sure key areas of our race are, are taken care of on race weekend, there would be no Grandma's Marathon. And I think that's been true since the very beginning, the, the very first race in 1977. Even that race wouldn't have happened without volunteers. 26.2 uh, miles, even 13.1 miles if the half marathon is uh, a lot of space to cover for uh, a small group of people. So we need an army and Duluth and Two Arbors and the surrounding community gives us that army. Well, a certain percentage of uh, marathon runners will become ill during or after the race. Some of, uh, most of the conditions are very mild and they just need time to rest and recover, but some of them can be serious and need someone some people with uh, some expertise that can help sort out which ones are serious and the right treatments for them. We help organize the medical volunteers, we write the medical protocols, we help with medical supply, we set up the medical tent, and then we take care of the sick runners. Most common problem is exercise associated collapse and that is a uh, drop in the blood pressure that happens when you stop running. Your circulatory system relies on muscle contractions in your legs to return blood to your head and uh, it takes time to readjust after the marathon. So sometimes that doesn't happen fast enough and people become lightheaded and weak, they have trouble walking. And that's the, the most common problem we see. Those people recover quickly. It's not a serious issue, but they, they do need some help for a little bit. It's, it's really an honor to, to work with these people that donate their time. They could have done anything today, but they chose to help other people.
against my race plan, run way faster than I was supposed to, uh, and see it pay off, it makes you wonder a little bit, like what, what more do I have that I'm not tapping into? I, can't, I could never even count how many people knew my first name, which my last name is on my bib, so occasionally here, go Lindworm. Um, but when people say, hey, go Dakota, you know that that person like, knows you, they follow you, and that just means so much. Having those people out there, that's why I love this so much. I feel like I'm putting on a show for them and I hope I'm inspiring them to, to see me and say, hey, that, that woman is leading and she's having fun. Maybe I can do that too. We always want to keep improving. We send out a survey, we listen to what people say, and we take uh, those uh, suggestions and see if we can implement them. And to, the move to Bayfront was tremendous, and we're very thankful to have a venue that can handle this many people. The idea that Duluth can do these great big things, even though we're a fairly small community, uh, is just this, this wonderful thing. And after the race each year, I, I kind of get overwhelmed with, with pride of, of what our community is able to do, because we're putting ourselves on a map. Well, we're out of time, but thanks to our guests and the crew here in the studio. I'm Julie Zenner. We'll see you next time.